It also involves giving advice to Muslims. As the Prophet ﷺ had said, Ad-Deenun Nasiha, the religion is good advice. And it also involves making jihad fi sabilillah. That there should be in our hearts a desire to make jihad. To sacrifice for the sake of Allah. And that if we're not able to do it ourselves, at least we help those who are involved. And there are jihads going on around the world today. Whether it is in Chechnya, or whether it's in Kashmir, whether it is in southern Philippines, there are jihads going on around the world today. If we have skills, we have ability to help in this jihad, because we are trained, we have specialized knowledge which these people need, then we should be there. It is far ain on each and every one of us to be there. But to go there just for the sake of going, to say I've been to jihad, then this is not advisable. Because those of us who don't have any training, don't have any background, to go and put ourselves in these situations, really we, be, we become a danger to those who are involved in jihad. I know many cases of brothers who went to Afghanistan during the time of the jihad there. You know, anybody could go basically. Brothers went and the mujahideen had to be carrying them up the mountains and down the mountains, you know. Because they, they were not used to this kind of lifestyle, they you know, couldn't deal with the snow, all the difficulty, they couldn't deal with it. And the mujahideen, alhamdulillah, you know, they, were, uh, they could understand the desire on the part of the brothers, so, you know, but it endangered themselves, carrying these guys on their backs up the mountains and down the mountains. They managed to hold a clashing cough for a minute, you know, they said, oh, I was there. And we have to be careful about our intentions, because going there just to be able to say, I was there, becomes something other than jihad. It becomes doing something for the sake of admiration of people. You know, that became a status symbol amongst Muslims for a while there. Who went to Afghanistan? And to a certain degree, who was going to Kashmir? You know, these type of things, we have to be very careful, you know, in terms of our intentions here. Because Prophet Muhammad Sallam, you know, had said, that of the first three people who would be thrown into hell would be a martyr, a shaheed. One who died not for the sake of Islam and keeping Allah's word high, but who fought to be known as a warrior for the admiration and the praise of people. And Allah says, you had your reward in that life. He will be dragged off on his face and thrown into hell. So we have to be very careful. Now when we come to a pressing issue that faces us today, in terms of the various groups which have developed in the last century, century and a half amongst Muslims, we have different movements whether it's the Ikhwan, Ikhwan al-Muslimun, al-Ikhwan al-Muslimun, or Jamaati Islami, or what may be referred to as the Salafis. We also hear about Wahhabis, Ahl al-Hadith, a variety of names out there for different groupings. We have to be very careful about these groupings, these groups. Because there's a hadith, a very important hadith which we all need to read. It's a hadith of Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman. 
in which he said, the people used to ask Allah as a messenger about the good, but I used to ask him about the evil in order that I wouldn't be overcome by it. On one occasion I asked Allah's Messenger, we are living in ignorance. We were living in ignorance and in an extremely bad atmosphere. Then Allah brought to us this good, Islam. Will there be any evil after this good? And he replied, yes. And I asked, Will there be any good after that evil? And he replied, yes, but it will be tainted. I asked, what will be its taint? And he replied, there will be some people who will guide others not according to my tradition, not according to my sunnah. You will approve of some of their deeds and disapprove of others. And I asked, Will there be any evil after that good? And he replied, yes. Some people calling at the gates of hell. Whoever responds to their call will be thrown by them into hell. And I asked, O Messenger of Allah, will you describe them to us? And he replied, they will be from our own people and will speak our language. And I asked, what do you order me to do if such a state should take place during my lifetime? And he replied, stick to the groups, the group of Muslims and their Imam, the Jama'ah, right? Jama'atul Muslimin. And I asked, if there is neither a group of Muslims nor an Imam, an Imam meaning a ruler, Imam al Mu'minin, he replied, then turn away from all of those sects, those groups, even if you were to bite your teeth into the roots of a tree until death overtakes you in that state. فَاعْتَزِلْ تِلْكَ الْفِرَقِ كُلَّهَا Avoid all of these groups. This was the advice of the Prophet Muhammad People ask, should I join this group or should I not join that group or whatever? This was the advice of Rasulullah Wasallam. Avoid all of these groups, meaning don't become a card-carrying member of these groups. However, if any of these groups are calling to good, then join them in what is good. Ta'awanu alal birri wa taqwa. Any of the groups, whether it's Jamaat al-Tabliq, which is the largest Islamic movement in the Muslim world today, if they're calling for something good, then we should join them in that good. But where we see the organizations have taken on a life of their own, where they now, instead of calling people to Islam and dealing with Islam, they're calling people to the organization. Where the good that you're doing is not recognized unless you're doing it through the organization. Then there is a danger here. This is factionalism. This is asabiyah. This had a danger in the past because the groups in and of themselves, when you look at the intent of the founders, those who founded these various movements, their intent was to try to re-establish Islam in our times. Bring Islam back into the lives of people, establish it on a community level, on the level of the, the country. This was their goal, this was their intent. But it became distorted in time. It became distorted in time and the groups became very rigid in how they looked at those who are part of the group and those who are not. It became an us and them mentality. If you're not with us, 
then it means you're against us. You know, this is very dangerous, this is very harmful. If we look at what happened with the madhahib, the schools of Islamic law, founded by the leading scholars of the Salaf, of the righteous, this early generation, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi'i, and Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, and others who were their contemporaries. But if we look at their intent, what they were doing, what their initial students did, they were involved in gathering together the Quran and Sunnah and applying it, practical fiqh, applying it to the lives of people. How do we apply the Quran and Sunnah? They were there guiding people. However, in time, due to a variety of factors, these groups took on a life of their own. These madhahib became like different religions. So much so that there was a ruling in the Hanafi madhab that Hanafis were not allowed to marry Shafi's. Around the Kaaba, for over a hundred years, there were four prayer places. When the time for prayer came, an imam from the different schools would lead those who are making tawaf who are from their madhab. When he was finished, then another imam would stand. This didn't stop until the Saud uh, movement took over Saudi Arabia and they tore down these structures which are around the Kaaba. You know, they call them the maqamat, maqam. We all know maqam Ibrahim. But people had added other maqams. Now there was maqam Hanafi, maqam Shafi'i, maqam Hanbali, you know, maqam Maliki. So they destroyed those. We put one imam. Everybody has to follow this one imam. Regardless. But up until that point, for hundred, over a hundred years, people, there were four different salahs going on around the Kaaba. And we still have remnants of it amongst us today. You know, where you will find some masjids where there are Hanafis and Shafis. I've run into this in, in, in uh, Hong Kong and in Singapore, some other areas, where you'll find groups of people where they're a mixture of Hanafis and Shafis, and they have to deal with Salatul Asr. Then you have one time for the Hanafis and one time for the Shafis. This, this approach splits a community into two parts. People are praying at different times. And the Hanafis are going to say, you pray at that time, that salah is not valid. You know, this is problematic. There is the dangers that came out of that. Alhamdulillah, in general, Muslims have gone past that. In the last hundred years, the fanaticism about the madhabs has settle down to a large degree. And people are more willing to deal with each other, pray behind each other, etc. Though there are some elements in our times, in the last decade, that are trying to stir up these flames and bring up the issues of the madhabs again. Promote. You must follow a madhab. I remember way back in the 70s before I'd gone over to study in Medina, there was a guy out of uh, Turkey writing books. His name was Hussein Ishik. He had written a bunch of books and he was a heavy madhabist. You know, and I remember one of his books, he was saying in his book, he said, you must follow a madhab. If you don't follow a madhab, then your imam is shaitan. <laughs> and that among the questions which you will be asked in the grave, is not just a, who is your Lord, who was your messenger, and what was your religion, you will also be asked what was your madhab. This is an illness, this is a sickness. And there are reasons why it came about. Alhamdulillah, as I said, to a large degree we have overcome it. But we're falling back into it with the different groups again. The potential exists.